you were in for a treat today. You're going to meet somebody who became a legendary painter and then gave it all up to do something completely different. You're going to learn about it today. Welcome, John Burton. Thanks for having me, Eric. Great to John, be here. Uh, John, John is a is a legendary landscape painter, fabulous painter, spent his life doing landscape painting. And now, John, you've given it all up. Tell us about what you're doing now. So uh, now I work in the film business. I'm what's called a production designer. So I work with a team of uh, totally amazing artists. And we are working on a film that will be coming out to theaters, if there are theaters in 2021, which we all <laughs> hope there is. Uh, it's it's a ex super exciting project. I'm working with uh, the part of the my art team. Some came from Disney, some from Pixar, some from Lucas. Uh, these artists are just amazing and building really interesting things. And like you said, what's incredible, I have not painted an oil painting in 2020. Uh, I still paint. I paint a ton. We go on research trips and and we'll go. Uh, in fact, I, I was on a research trip for the film in uh, in Africa when the uh, when COVID hit. So I needed to get out kind of a last minute thing. So pretty interesting times. But yeah, that's the only time I painted and I painted in gouache, but I haven't painted in oil uh, since since 2020 started. Well, and I knew you had kind of given up on oil anyway, and you were kind of devoting your life to gouache, um, which is a great medium for illustrators and designers anyway. So I'm curious, we're going to learn all about this. And, and what are you going to do for us today? So today I'm going, I've brought up a, a bunch of photographs and I thought what we do is some value studies and color studies and what I will be doing because in the film business, I work far more digitally, um, but all the concepts are the same, right? The same as, as if I was working in oil or gouache, but I think the speed in turnaround and how to do a study and how to get color relationships ready to build, like if you're ready to build an oil painting, how can you do that in a digital medium? whether it be Photoshop is pretty high powered for something like that. But even if you're working on your iPad, I can give suggestions on how to do that. Okay. That's terrific. All right. We're looking forward to this and I want to learn more about the film and, and anything that you can talk about. I know sometimes things are a little hush hush, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be back in a minute. Sounds great. All right. So our guest today is John Burton, who is a, uh, a reformed, uh, oil painter, reformed to a gouache painter, and and now reformed to the film business, which will be really interesting to learn more about. Uh, I've been trying every day now for 230 days in a row, mostly in a row, uh, to uh, try and bring you things that will stimulate your brain, keep you focused, and, and not worrying about things like COVID or uh, the drama of elections and everything else going on in our lives, right? So, I was thinking uh, last night after after our time with Angus McEwen yesterday uh, in Scotland, I was thinking about, you know, it's so much fun to learn new things and discover things that we haven't tried yet. And everybody's got a little different angle and everybody's got a little something different. So I'm going to start reaching even deeper and deeper and trying to bring you some things that are outside of your comfort zone, outside of my own comfort zone, because I think by doing that, we're going to become better at whatever it is we want to do. And so if you're with me on that, that's that's kind of the direction I'll go. That doesn't mean I'm, I'm going to stop doing things within your comfort zone too, but I, I've got to stimulate some, some new, fresh ideas from time to time. Uh, so uh, today, day number 230, I want to say thank you for being here. I see there are people tuning in from all over the world. I saw India and New Zealand and Norway and... Uh, uh, quite a few others. It would be helpful if you say where you're watching from. Hi, Hawaii, Saskatchewan, Mexico. Um, uh, man, uh, did I say India? I did. Uh, so anyway, thank you for tuning in today and saying that uh, we have prizes for you uh, every day. Today, we're giving away a pair of value specs. Value specs are something that you basically glasses that help you. They reduce uh, you can be looking outdoors, you can be looking at a photo, and it reduces everything down to the, the values so that you can really see what your values are, your darks and your lights, because our eyes get fooled by color. When you take color out of the equation, you may think something is a brighter value when, in fact, it's just a high chroma color, but it's not necessarily a, a brighter value. And so uh, I use them when I paint. I use them when I do underpaintings. Uh, and it's a cool thing. So we're giving away a pair to Marilyn Witt, Witt from Indiana. 
Uh, Marilyn, I'm uh, born and drug up, as they say, uh, in, in Indiana, so it's nice to give something to someone from Indiana. Today, we're giving away a digital subscription to Plen Air Magazine for tomorrow's giveaway. Leave a comment in the comment section, and the digital has 20% more content than the print magazine. And, of course, the magazine uh, is, here's the current cover, um, and the magazine is on the newsstands. Uh, you can find it at Barnes & Noble. As a matter of fact, it's the number one selling art magazine in America. And in fact, it, it outsells all the photography magazines in the art and photography category. We're pretty proud of that. We also just went into Michael's stores. Uh, Michael's is getting very interested in the whole plein air movement. And uh, they now have added Plein Air Magazine. I think it's the only art magazine in Michael's. I may be wrong about that. There are a lot of things like crafting and knitting and things like that. But I think this is the only one about painting. And it's in 278 Michael's stores. Now, if you're tuning in for the first time, uh, I didn't even introduce myself, did I? My name is Eric Rhodes. I'm publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air Magazine. I also do the Plein Air Podcast. Plein Air Podcast is... Uh, heard around the world, uh, now millions and millions of downloads, and uh, you can find it at uh, any place you get podcasts, Spotify, Apple, uh, uh, OutdoorPainter.com, etc. cetera. Uh, I also am the uh, proud uh, host of the Art Marketing Minute. I teach art marketing, and uh, that is also a podcast. And you can find that online as well, anywhere you get your podcast. But it is also at artmarketing.com where you'll find lots of blogs about art marketing. The goal here is to help you learn how to become a successful full-time artist if that's what you want to do. There's no pressure to do that. That includes my book, uh, Make More Money Selling Your Art, uh, a bunch of videos, and a bunch of other things. So um, anyway... We also should mention to you that the Plen Air Convention is coming up in May. Uh, we gather as a community uh, for five days. In Colorado this year, uh, we were supposed to be there last year. We had to cancel. We had, I think, 1,200 people registered. And uh, now, obviously, a lot of people are not registered, and we're hoping that uh, you will be able to get you back and that we'll be able to hold it. It's going to be May 23rd through 27th. We extended the deadline. We were going to do it earlier, uh, but we decided because of COVID, nobody could make up their mind on anything anyway. So uh, the deadline now to get the price increase, uh, to get in before the price increase is Valentine's Day. So you can uh, check that out, but it's going to be pretty big. And if we are required to socially distance at that time, of course, nobody knows, uh, then we probably will only be able to have about five or 600 people. I would probably got about 500 registered now, maybe, maybe a few more. Uh, anyway, that's that. Uh, mentioning that um, I'm taking a group to Russia, I, I can only take 48 people. I have 358 people who have expressed interest. And so we may have to have a, a drawing or a lottery for the people that want to get in. But uh, Get your name in if you're interested in that painting trip. It's going to be painting and touring uh, throughout St. Petersburg and Moscow. But the best part are going to be the small, old, antique villages in the middle of nowhere, including uh, the Academic Dasha, which is where the, uh, the great Russian masters were trained and painted. We're also going to the schools where these artists were trained. So we're going to go to the Repin Institute and to the Serikov Institute. I've taken people there before. It's a wonderful experience. We have a a great Russian master, Nikolai Dubovik, who's going to be with us uh, most of the time, more, more on our village trips and in the, in the Moscow time, maybe not in St. Petersburg. Uh, mentioning also, I've got uh, Sunday Coffee, which is a blog I do every Sunday morning. It has very little to do with art, but it has a lot to do with thoughts on life. I wrote it originally for my kids. Uh, it's coffeewitheric.com if you want to find it. And last but not least, uh, I should mention to you, that we have a fabulous uh, new event coming up called Watercolor Live. It's a virtual conference. It's five or four days, uh, the 28th through 30th of January with a beginner day on the 27th. We have some of the most impressive, most uh, world-renowned watercolor artists in the world going to be on that event. And uh, we're very excited to have them. I'm not going to go through the names right now, but you can find them at watercolorlive.com. Also, uh, if you're a watercolorist, make sure you sign up for Watercolor, American Watercolor Newsletter. It's free, and just go to AmericanWatercolor.net slash subscribe. You have uh, the ability to subscribe and find all of the videos that we have done over the last 
230 days. They're on YouTube. You can find them at Streamline Art Video. There are art marketing uh, discussions. There are interviews with art collectors. There's interviews with artists. There's demos. There's just tons of things. So check that out. Go to YouTube and subscribe. Just look up Streamline Art Video. Okay, I'm done hacking, hawking my, <laughs> my wares, hacking my wares. Uh, John Burton is back. John, I'm, uh, I'm honored you would be here today. Uh, your mic is muted. Let's, well, you're going to have to unmute it. Uh, make sure that I wasn't uh, uh, making a noise during, uh, while I was backstage. So uh, uh, that was fun. Thank, thank you, Eric. I also thank you for two things. One is I've always respected and, and considered you a great asset to the art community. Thank you for all you've done to push not only plein air painting, but all art forward. So I appreciate that through the convention, through your magazine, and even through this. Uh, I really appreciate it. I also know how much effort what you're doing takes to do this every day because at the start of COVID, I did something called Get Better During the Blip, which I gave art classes to kids and did it through the community of not only fine artists, but in the film industry. And keeping it going every day was uh, was exhausting. It was fulfilling, but it was exhausting. So I appreciate you. Thank you, Eric. You're very welcome. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. So uh, tell us about this company you're working for and can you tell us about the film? I can't tell you. I've signed NDAs on the film, unfortunately. But okay. uh, All right. uh, the I gave a little hint. My research trips, uh, you know, I've, I've, we're around the world, so it doesn't. The, the film's not going to be taking place here in North America. And uh, but the the team is absolutely amazing. The, the studio is called Sunrise, which is a. I just can't say enough for the team. There's uh, the the group of artists blow my mind every day um, on who I get to work with and who I get to learn with right so now. So is this, a, is this a, a startup animation studio? So they've been a studio for 20 years. Um, and I don't know who the film will be distributed uh, through in the end. Um, I don't know if it'll come out through a, a company that maybe you might recognize the name, but, but the team is handpicked from Pixar, Lucas, DreamWorks, uh, Disney, and uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm so excited. I can't, it's hard because there's so much I want to talk about, but I, I know, I know. Well, we'll find out eventually. Yes, but but in my field, what I get to do is we're working on costume, we're working on um, loca site locations, uh, we're looking on, working on character, working on the color um, keys, the theme of the, the movie through color. It's there, I just can't say enough for how exciting it is to work in. And that's what's really pulled me away from, from being able to oil paint because not only is it time consuming, but the joy I get out of it is 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 incredible. And and I want to encourage artists who are watching this not to just tell yourself, well, this is movie stuff. I don't want to watch this. You're going to learn more about painting in this segment probably than than anything you've watched in a while. One of my favorite things to do, John, is I, I oftentimes will go to animated movies. I because I'm a dad, I went to animate hundreds of animated movies over the years, and probably less apt to do so now that they're in college. But uh, oftentimes there's a movie where the, the sets, the light, the color, everything is just so spot on. And oftentimes someone will release a book about those sets and the, and the light and so on. So it's one of my favorite things to collect because I learned so much about painting and the idea of, you know, putting everything in one particular key or one particular color theme. So you're essentially... Uh, as a production designer, you're kind of responsible for uh, that entire process. Is that right? Yeah. So the production designer works with the yeah the whole team, but yeah, as your the production designer it lands on your desk quite often with with uh, to answering to the and to present and pitching to the director. But I'm one piece to a larger the head of character and the and and, and the art director and and everyone comes together. And it, I, you know, I'll tell you one thing, coming from fine art, uh, working with a team has been an incredible experience because fine art, and, and maybe you feel this, Eric, but when I work in the fine art field, uh, it's a handful of friends, colleagues, who I send pictures on my iPhone, or, hey, what do you think of this? Or, you know, an artist like Jesse Powell is right down the uh, studio is right next to mine, so we just walk over. And, but to have a full team, is it such an experience um, because the give and take of, okay, they have this thought that might be a little different, but at the same time, most often they have a thought that's way better than mine, that I took it to a certain point that someone can take it further and someone can take it further. 
Well, they say there's wisdom in multiple counselors, right? So yeah. that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So you're, you must be living in Monterey. Yeah. So my studio is still in Monterey Carmel. Yep. Absolutely. And, uh -huh. uh, and where are you, Eric? Are you, uh, in, in, in uh, Indiana? At the moment I'm in Austin, Texas. I, Austin, Texas. Um, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I was in California for 10 years and then moved here. Uh, been here for 11 and now it's time to go somewhere else. Time to so, change. uh, I, yeah, you got to move every 10 years. You got to keep your brain moving. Yeah, keep fresh. So, so John, um, so t t tell us a little bit more about what you're going to move into today, what you're going to, what yeah, you're going to be yeah, showing. Yeah. So a huge change for me in the art world and the whole, I think the whole fact I even moved into film was, and, and this is, I, 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 it might be a, a it seems small, but it's actually really big to me. I was an oil painter for a couple of decades. And I started re-examining that. And especially with the artist, you know, Brian Mark Taylor is, Brian Mark Taylor is a great artist and a great friend. And we would talk for hours of what it meant to be an artist. And here's the interesting thing, as you talk about being an artist, when you and I are in our studios, Eric, I have really high ideals, right? I'm this artist, right? I, I, I create. Then I go to the gallery and I'm a commodity. I could be Crest toothpaste or I could be bread. I'm a commodity on the wall. Then I go to somebody's house and I'm wallpaper that matches the couch. So <laughs> from very high ideals, I drop, I drop to another place. And that's all fine. I'm, I'm totally fine with that process. But Brian and I would talk for hours of what it meant to be an artist. What is an artist? What, what does it mean to me? And you have to define that. Um, I wish I had it written in front of me. I'll see if I can recite it. I know in art school, what it meant to be a painter, I, I, I felt like I needed to define what that was. And it was to the effect of um, painting is the internalization of, I wish I had it written, but I'm gonna try to remember my quote. Uh, or, uh, painting is the internali internalization of beauty and then conveying how you felt in a poetic way. That's what painting was. So it was my guiding light was one, I need to internalize. So I needed to get outside to internalize it because if I was always looking at photo reference, I wasn't internalizing it. I was, I was hearing AM radio instead of a full Bose sound system that, you know, that you know, I wasn't getting enough. That was one piece, but then I needed to convey it in a poetic way, which meant I, once I internalized it, I wanted it to come out poetry the other side. I didn't want to be a camera. We have a camera. So there was a realm of what I wanted. This, I, and by the way, this isn't the definition for everybody. This was my definition. And then a few years ago in these discussions with Brian, I changed who I was. And when I changed, I became a shape maker. And I said, said I'm not an oil painter. I'm not an acrylic painter. I'm not a gouache painter. I'm not a digital painter. I'm a shape maker. And when I became a shape maker, it changed how I looked at everything because I reduced the high idea of what I was in my studio to what I was in the gallery to what I was in the home. I said, what excites me the most in other people's paintings and what excites me the most in my paintings? And it was good shape distribution. I came to the conclusion it wasn't anything else. Like for me personally, it was shape distribution. And when I decided it was shape distribution, I no longer cared if it was oil. Which, which I devoted my life to. Then I started painting in gouache and then I started painting in acrylic and then I started painting digitally and saying, okay, how do I get the best shapes? However I do that and then the film business, that, that door opened and I, and I went into there. That's the place I feel like I can make the best shapes right now. Uh, so anyway, that reduces it from where I was to where I am. Well, it's interesting how the film business, especially in the animation side has embraced the arts community as well. I, I know that Brian and friends, other friends of ours have been brought in to do, um, to, to do workshops, to do demos, to work with animators, to help them see, get them, get them outdoors painting so that they can really see light and, and uh, form differently because, you know, I think that really informs it. So it's really nice that you're in a situation where you can really influence so many people. I mean, you're, you're, you're bringing art, you're bringing art to different walls, really. I mean, yeah. you know, millions of walls. Right, you're, you're right. And it is just one more form and, and they are both art forms. What's interesting, I think, because of social media, that we're aware of each other a lot more. 
I think the fine art used to stay in one lane and the concept art uh, for film used to stay in another lane. But now everyone's becoming more aware of each other and connecting. And yeah, just we, we actually had, you know, we've been doing these virtual conferences. We did Plein Air Live. We did Realism Live. Now we're doing Watercolor Live. We actually had people from uh, the film industry who attended, who are artists in the film industry, who wanted to, you know, get more informed on certain, the Plein Air Live was the one that, that most of them attended, but get more informed on what these great artists can offer them. You know, speaking of a name that comes to mind when you said that is Mike Hernandez, who yes. he has really crossed over. I mean, in the in he is a huge name in the film industry. And now in the fine art industry, I'd put his paintings up with anybody. He is yeah. just a fantastic uh, painter yeah. and, and a good friend of mine. Yeah, great guy. We did a video with him and uh, we, we, he's, he's terrific. Well, yeah. why don't we let you get started? I don't want to eat into your time. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna pop off screen and then you've got another screen here. I'm gonna add in, and um, super. Okay, so I'll be working on here. I did pull up uh, Facebook Live. Oh, I can't hear you anymore, Eric. Oh, uh, you should be able to know. There we can. I can now. Yeah. Um, so I pulled up Facebook Live on my phone. So I'll occasionally, I can't promise I'll look a lot, but I'll look occasionally and see if there's a question. I want to make this as, as interactive as possible. You know, I can do that for you. I'll, okay. I'll monitor comments. And then okay. when you get questions, okay. I'll just read them in. We'll okay. tell you where people are watching from. Okay, super. Um, let me pull up. Uh, my apologies. I want one more thing up on my screen to show you. And I thought it had it. All right. Meanwhile, hello, Denmark. Uh, snowy in Spokane. All right. Got Alaska. All right. Okay. Well, I I will actually wanted to start here, um, even before I show some of my images. Let me just take you on a little trip of some of my friends slash heroes. Um, can you make that screen any bigger? I sure can. Yep. I've made it as big as I can. There you go. How's that? That's, yeah, that's, that's okay. great. Thank you. So uh, this is, I just want to go through a couple artists and, and their effect on me in the world. Uh, this is uh, Scott Christensen. And uh, talk about a shape maker. He is so interested in shape. And to even uh, if you go to any of the places that he's painted, I do think that it's interesting how he conveys the place and you go there and like, well, that rock's not exactly that rock. Um, but he gets the feel and the taste of what it's like because his, his concern in shape. Uh, this one's a little large, my apologies. Another Scott Christensen, uh, Matt Smith, uh, another fantastic artist who underline has all that same shape making. Uh, and, but he has also this, this delicate hand in, in how he handles like the foreground and, and things that he handles bushes and things that are like smoke and still is able to grab, grab onto them. Uh, uh, another great friend, Jesse Powell, we, we have studios right next door to each other and, and, uh, has certainly influenced me. I actually am lucky enough to own this painting by, uh, by Jesse, uh, Larry Moore. Mm. Another incredible artist uh, who pushes, talk about pushing boundaries, Eric, who definitely pushes, pushes brown boundaries in his art. Uh, David Dibble, one of the, one of the best designers I know and uh, incredible artist. Uh, Wee Han Lui, one of my teachers in school. I credit him as, as, as one of my huge influences in, in the teaching and learning uh, and development I have. Uh, Wee Han is totally amazing. Another Jesse Powell. Another David Dibble, another me, or a me and Situ, another great friend who has completely influenced me with the way he handles value and shape. His drawing skills are off the charts. Uh, Mark Delasio, I wish I had a better image than this. Another good friend who is a really is, if you ever get a chance to paint with him live outside, it's marvelous. Another Mark Delasio and Matt Smith, another me and Situ. Uh, I mentioned Brian Taylor, one of the masters out there, uh, uh, Brian Taylor, this, the way he creates these, um, and, uh, he's just an amazing artist. Uh, I want to show that when we talk about the shape making that this is his fine art and oh, there's Scott Christensen. And now here's his science fiction art where he's just interested in creating shape. I want to go back, look at the, the same artist creating that. 
and using all the, all the tools and all the knowledge to then create this. Yeah. So, yeah, all right. right. And then one more Larry Moore. I own that one. One more me in situ. Weehan, Gabor Svagrik. And I think that's it. Let's get painting. So, all but right. I think there's well, the all fabulous artists. Thank you for that. Yeah, I wanted to, I think it's important to share the artists that influence me because uh, I don't only look at deceased. I, I look at my friends and I was talking before. These are artists that I could send an image to and ask questions. And I highly recommend in life if you can find those artists who you can connect with and bounce ideas off of um, because the, the value in, in getting your art to a higher level is immeasurable. Um, I do, if you could leave me just a minute in the end, I do want to get into painting, but I would like to show um, a few images. I just have to find where it is of what I'm working on in the film business. Okay. Um, I think that would be worthwhile. So, um, okay. So let's first talk about uh, the top left image that you can see here is, and I'm working in Photoshop. I was discussing that, uh, Larry, I'm working on a Cintiq for those who don't hear them. So you can see me from the side. Uh, I'm working on something called a Cintiq, which if you can, can you see me and see maybe the angle well enough? Maybe hey, not. Hey, do you want to be on camera too? Oh, no, no, I don't need to. Okay. Never mind. I, th I could see myself, but I'm in backstage. No, I'm good. I don't yeah. need to. Okay. All right. Um, is that I'm using a stylus, which is like a pen, and I'm using it on a, I'm actually drawing on a screen right now. Yeah. So, but for those of you who don't know, this is a high level, um, uh, I'm using Photoshop, which has taken me quite a while to, I feel like I'm, I hate to use a word, but I feel like I'm kind of an expert on it now. I really understand how the program works. Um, but at a lower end, if you had an iPad and you can get either Photoshop for the iPad or Procreate, you can do and do a lot of the concepts that I'm doing here. So I want to start by how do I see these images? So if I'm going to, let's start with, with this. Maybe that would be the now best. Keep in mind, uh, John, I, if there's any way to make these any bigger because people oh. are watching on their phones and, and their little screens. It's going to be okay. tough. To I'll do it a little bit, but I will share, Eric, quite often I start as small as possible. Okay. Will, All right. Makes sense. But, but the reason I, I start, and I'll show you why, if I look at, I'm looking at this image right here, okay, is it's kind of the forest of the trees is if I look at it too close, I get too concerned with rocks and um, I get a couple values in yeah, here. So you're going for big shapes. Yeah, big shapes. If I, if I claim to be a shape maker, I'm always talking about that. Um, let's, let me get on a new layer or actually I'll do it right. Hold on one second. Larry Moore is going to be on here tomorrow, by the way. Oh, he is fantastic. Uh, he, I highly wreck his thoughts. Oh my gosh. Mind blowing on his thoughts and ideas in, uh, in, uh, in painting and designing and shapes. So I just want to give a concept and I'll do this much bigger is when I'm designing, if we think of earth, uh, earth has, um, North America, South America, Europe, um, Africa, Antarctica, sorry, Australia's there, apologize, and I'm not getting the other side of Asia, which I can do and do later. I could have done a flat map. I should have, so I'd get a little more. But I do want to get a concept across, is when I'm thinking shapes, the world is interesting because of these continents and these large shapes. But kind of the spice of life is the islands. If I think of um, Cuba, which I believe you've been to, um, if I think of uh, England or Greenland, Iceland, any, I want to put Madagascar, but it's off my map, Hawaii, those are kind of the spice of life, but we can't see them if we don't get the large continents in first. So when I'm working small, I'm trying to see the world like this and not getting into the states or the countries, uh, but, but saying a large mass, okay? 
And that's, that's the big advantage of working small. So if I look at this image, um, the beach, the beach one, and I come in here with some value, right? There's a big advantage because I'm going to find ways that I'm probably going to connect those shapes that I wouldn't connect otherwise if I was working, wasn't working small. So it's and, the same. And do you want to explain why connecting shapes is important to you? Yeah. Thank you for asking because it helps create structure and not only structure in your shape, but structure and design that if you do not, um, and you don't have to connect all the shapes. I tend to want to connect either the lights or the darks. And um, once you connect those, it, it helps unify an entire, uh, uh, an entire design. So you can see as I, I stutter a little bit once I start painting because I kind of get in the groove and the thought of what's happening. Um, but here's, here's some big shapes. And I'm going to refine these more later. But... Uh, that is how I would end up seeing that. And it when reads. I, it reads. It reads great. And yeah. when I see that, now I'm going to look for maybe shadows in the water, and then I can carve. I'm a big fan of carving. And what carving is, is coming into the shapes, putting them in large, and this is, I do all the time with oil painting, is I don't accept my shapes when I first put them in. I have a, a mantra, and my mantra is, I may not be right, but I am certain which means I need to put it down right as good as I can with as much confidence as I can at the start, but I know I'm not perfect and I know I'm going to be doing corrections. So uh, put it down, I may not be right, but I am certain is a way of saying, put it down with as much confidence as you possibly can and then you can always come back and redesign. So you can see in this one, I'll go in red, I have, taking a path through my darks that come close to connecting. Now, since they're not exactly, I can do some small tweaks to connect these up and can give a little more solidity of form. But you can see the carving in, I believe, is what really, when people talk about a painterly look, the painterly look, I think, comes out from this carving. You know, at the, we quite often want to say, kind of give up, like, okay, we got it. It's good enough now. Let's just leave it. So let me do one more. We'll, uh, and that's, I think that that really reinforces the idea of doing a, a you know, just a, a black and white study, a no tan or something like that early on, because, you know, you, if, if you don't do that up front, you don't really know where you're going. Do you, do you do it at all? Or do you just lay them in like this? No, so I, I go straight to color when I paint color, but I am a huge fan. I'll do a pitch for Portland Grays. Uh, if you're working in oils, buy Portland Grays or buy Gamblin. They come in um, Portland Gray light, medium, and deep. And the colors that I put here off to the side are, they mimic that. Uh, the reason I would say do it with Portland Grays rather than just using a grayscale with black and is because there's a temperature bias that as you keep adding white, it keeps cooling. But if you use Portland grays, uh, there's no temperature bias. They, they all sit within the same temperature. So that doesn't bother your eye. It, like what I'm painting right here, when I, when I say temperature bias, let me show you what I mean by that. Is if I was going to paint a painting and I had my, my whites that kind of fell in this pink area, and then my middle value fell in a little bit of a bluish value. Now I'm going the extreme. If you're working black, it doesn't quite do this, but it will, um, it will work in a certain temperature. So what ends up happening is you, your eye gets too caught up on the color instead of worrying about value. Yeah. So yeah, you can do this digitally or you can use Portland grays or you can do with just black and white if you want, but the Portland grays really hold value a little better. So if I want to make sure I understand this. You're saying that you'll you'll block in your paintings with Portland grays before you do anything else? No, no. no. What I will do is do Just small studies. I will take a, if this was my canvas, what you're looking at here, it would actually have tape everywhere there's white. And I would do studies from three to four inches in that range to four to six, that size. And I would do Portland gray studies. I see. Okay. 
within there. I'm actually going to look on my computer and it will take one second. I may have a, a study that I could share with you. Somebody should put Portland Gray from Gamblin in the comments section, please. Yeah. Hello, Costa Rica. Welcome. Do I have? Uh, I don't have a Portland Gray reference, but I do have a taping reference. So I'll just show you an image of how a, a second thing that I would recommend. And so this is, this is only on my easel because, um, because I've, uh, I was just taking the tape off, but these were painted on location. Uh, I just close to where my studio is, but these are all about in, they're not quite proportionally, but they're like four by six. And one thing I'd like to teach today is not only some concepts, but quantity that if you're going to get outside and you're going to paint a 12, 16, 16, 20, and you can only do one a week and then you're exhausted, or you can go out and do a thousand four by sixes uh, or six by eights. I strongly recommend in this I just put it on one canvas and this was all one location. I just turned left and then turned right and then turned, look straight ahead. So I got three paintings within about, I don't know, maybe an hour. And was, and I always think of that. I would, this is how I always look at it. I was three paintings better after this, right? Yeah. They might not all be successful, but I had certainly learned. Well, and they're going to inform you in other ways. One of the things I find frustrating is, you know, you get on an airplane and you go to a beautiful place and then you spend, you know, a half day doing a single painting or, you know, or maybe two, two or three a day, but you could, you know, there's so much more you could get, you know, if you, if you took that attitude and just did a lot of little ones. Yeah. When you say that too, when I travel, I can't paint big when I get there because I think maybe you get the same air because you're so excited. Like you, I know you've been to Cuba or when I've been in living in South America or traveling in Europe, it's like, I, I can't paint a big one. I just have to kind of get a few paintings out of me because I'm so excited to see the places. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Now I do want to share, because when I pulled up the black and white, I think it might be interesting to see, like, here's an, an example of that same scene uh, that I just did the oil painting of that. Now this was created digitally. So I can come in and, and just do a, you know, a, a painting once I'm back in my studio of kind of the memory of what it was like and enhance and pull color and move things around. So this is just one pass at it, but this was the same, everything you're seeing in here is the same method that I paint in gouache or in oil and it's Very more about tape and color relationship. Actually, I, I love that because it's a great way to kind of figure it out before you start opening up your oils. Absolutely. In a, in a um, time cost effective way, meaning yeah. you haven't invested that much time in getting it out and putting down things because you have control Z. If you don't hit something right, you can always erase and, and go backwards. We have control Z in oil painting. It's called a palette knife. <laughs> it's a bag <laughs> and a palette knife and turpentine. Exactly. So, okay. So moving into the, the ideas and concepts here. Um, let's do, I'm going to do one more, uh, with value and then I will jump into color because I, I, these are all concepts that take a lot more time to discuss, but we can at least get some notes down. And I always feel a success. If I can get anyone to work in oil paints in Portland grays, I feel like a success because they were a huge way that I was able to see shape in a different way in a more abstracted way. I'm not an abstract painter, but I think the best paintings have abstraction in them. As you see, my top left painting here, that's a gouache painting. And uh, and there's there's abstraction in all the shapes. The beauty is is how those come together. Well, Portland, uh, uh, Gamble will wonder all of a sudden why everybody's buying Portland Gray today. We, exactly. had, a we had somebody on the other day and, and uh, they mentioned a single paint and they sold 800 tubes that day. They couldn't figure wow. out why. <laughs> Let me add one more thing to the Portland Gray that I recommend if, if, you, if people go out and buy it today, is when you do your studies, uh, the goal is to keep in an in a economy of values. So when you do your study, don't transition. And what I mean by that is don't find 22 values in between the grays. Use just those grays and black and white, and that will keep you five values. But if you start blending Portland Gray deep and Portland Gray light, all of a sudden you're going to get to 10 values. Uh, what, uh, what we're trying to do here is find graphic shapes. Right. Okay. So 
I'm going to work on this one right here. Let me get it in. So uh, let's see with a, uh, I'm gonna put it right here. I also, this is something from my teachers in school is always working in an uncomfortably large brush. I love those words. If you notice, for me, I love to draw. So if I'm gonna draw this one, that, that tree one, you know, I can always draw that tree and put in those shapes. You know, how do those work? How do they come together? Right? I can draw. Um, for me personally, unless I'm working on a like five foot by six foot painting, you may notice I don't draw because to get that more painterly feel, I want to uh, start with an uncomfortably large brush and trust myself because I feel like if I know how to draw, there's no reason I can't carve back because my eraser is always the shape right next to whatever I drew with. And so let me. Great advice. Yeah. Because I also, I don't want to be a coloring book, right? So I know I can start with these fairly large shapes. And this gives me, it's big picture ideas. That's what I'm looking for is these big picture ideas. In fact, I'm going to change that value just a hair deeper. So, yeah. That's very helpful. Oh, good. It's helped me a ton. Okay, so this might, because I'm using a round tool, this might look like, what in the world are you doing there, John? But watch how we can carve out. I'm going to come back. All I'm doing is taking the background color. So I'm not using an eraser. I'm using it just like I would in oils. And look how I carve out. This is exactly how I do my oil, oil paintings. I come in and I take, you know, I, and this is where I can start using maybe a little more refined brush where I can carve out these shapes and make them. What I'm getting is variety because that's, I think that's really one of the beauties of art is we're always looking for variety. And if we can get variety of shape, then then there's going to be some interest. Very, very good. Great. Thank you. You know, I never, I, I've always been taught about big shapes, but I never thought about just getting them in there and then carving them out. Yeah. What a big difference it makes. Huge, huge difference, I think. Um, and but you know what it comes with, Eric, is trust. I just don't think as an artist, you know, all of us have fear, you know, art fear, which is so ridiculous. You know, you invest in a painting, you invest in time, you invest on whatever you're doing is that trust of saying, I can do this right over and over again, just that telling yourself. And that goes back to what I was saying. I may not be right, but I'm certain is, I, I, you know, I might not be right, but I'm going to put it down with so much confidence, like even that stroke I did right there. I put it down with a lot of confidence knowing that, yeah, I'll carve and make that shape more interesting, right? I put it in and it's, it was not a, a, not a super interesting shape, but that doesn't mean I can't fix that shape. I think another thing that's important is if something isn't right, don't fall in love with it. Yes. Because, you know, it, it, it's, you know, you're, you're like feeling really good that you got something right. And you just like, oh, I don't know if I could get it that good again, but you know, it's in the wrong place or, you know, it doesn't fit. You just got to be willing to abandon it. I totally agree. Just say, okay, why not? I did it once. I can do it again. I'll probably do it faster the next time. Yeah. So and probably better. Yeah, and probably better. Absolutely. But that's um, always a lot easier to say than to do. So that's a, unfortunately I have that. Let me delete the edges on that. I thought I had my thing locked, but we clean up the sides there. And I, I want to mention again with these value studies, if you paint them like this, and you're not worried about, you know, it's not going to the Louvre, it's not going to the Prado, and it's not going to the Met. It's only for yourself. There's so much joy. I just can't tell you how much joy there is when you're painting and you create something like that and you start carving it out and it starts turning into something. It, it's, it's hard to get the confidence to do it, but once you do it, it's, I hate to use the word addicting, but it's, it's kind of addicting because you, you just keep wanting to see how you can push yourself and worry about shape. So on this one, I'm, I, I'm going, 
you know, someone close to the reference, but if I was really designing it, when you're worrying about shape, actually, let me do it. I'll do it differently and just in. If you were paint, if you were painting a study in Portland gray, uh, how big would you make it? Really small, four by six or small? Really small, yeah. Uh, four by six, five by seven. Yeah. Because it's only for myself uh, and it's not for anybody else. It's not this finished painting. It's, yeah, you know, I, ju I just want to get those relationships because I think there's so much time invested in a painting that's poor, at least for myself. Like I've come to the realization over the years, I don't hit it 100% of the time. I wish I did. Yeah. But if I'm a 50% I, in oil painting, I'm happy. The world doesn't see all my warts unless they come to my studio. And they come to my studio and I was like, oh my gosh, you painted that, that. Yeah, that's, that's how I got the ones that did work. But the Portland Grays give me a higher hit ratio. Or, and I keep saying Portland Grays value studies, but value studies in a graphic way that I could then, when I talk about shape distribution, once I do this design, I may look at it and say, yeah, you know what? My tree is right in the center. I don't think that's that's as interesting as I would like it. What if my tree ended up here? You know, I, I can do that quickly because I haven't invested the time. Yeah. And because I also know from my very first one, it took of, I don't know, we weren't timing it, all of what, three minutes? Yeah. You know, there was well, that's, that's why I like this idea of, of digital because you can really play with ideas quickly. You're not even having to blow through paint. Totally. But I will say when I work, when you do work in value, even if it's in oil paint, you it's incredibly quick. Uh, I'll give you like a timing for me. I can get six to 10 of these a day, which is which is pretty fast. So one thing I like to do, I call it my art calisthenics. And I'll come in and start my morning and do like five uh, Portland Gray paintings and uh, or value studies. I keep using Portland Gray, but value studies. And once I get those value studies down, those are something to build off. I can then sit on those. And as I start building a, a um, file of all those paintings, it gives me something that one day I come in like, oh, I really like that design. You know what I mean? Instead of just every morning starting saying, this has to be great. Well, it, I, the chances of me waking up and just hitting it every day are so slight. Yeah. Where my chances are I'm going to be much higher if I do 50 and then pick my top 10. So, okay. So that's, I'm not going to refine that because I'd like to move into a little bit of color now that we. Yeah. You got about um, eight minutes, eight minutes. Okay. So I do want to before, so I don't miss that time. I do want to look real quick while you're looking at that and show just what I'm talking about with, uh, let me see real quick if I can find, um, My apologies, just gonna show you some. I had it up, but, oh, here we go. I had it up, but it's not. All right, just wanna give an example of, here, I'll pull it over here and play. Great, so you can see this. Oh, it came and went. Why is it not letting me play? I don't know. know. Okay, so we'll hold it here for right now. And uh, so this is sort of the things that I'm doing in the film business. Um, How fun. Yeah, it's, it, it's based, I think it's important to show this because it's all based on the knowledge I gained from decades of painting outside and creating shapes and value and how light works. It's just taking it to other places. Um, I do want to acknowledge, I do, it's funny because he's probably tired of hearing it if he's ever heard it, is a thank you. So what happened when I decided to become a shape maker, uh, Brian Mark Taylor and I went to a conference, a film conference, and uh, got to know an artist and became great friends with Dylan Cole, if you've uh, seen the movies Avatar. So he's the production designer for the all the upcoming avatars and worked on the previous avatars. And uh, it, it, he, the, the effect he had on the change in my life on how to see and how to think and what to do um, digitally has been immense. So I, it's so hard. It's funny. It's like I can never talk about the film industry without giving a nod to the effect that he has had uh, and on my art career. It's amazing meeting someone that would have that big of a change. And, so, and was that from watching his work, watching him paint? What was it that, that had that effect? 
he's actually we we've oil painted we go oil painting together uh he's actually an amazing oil painter uh he's just a gifted artist but from seeing his work and to see talking to him and how he sees the world and how he paints uh it, everything just it, it had just a just a massive change which you can see if you look at this from uh from my oil paintings two things had to happen one is uh, is changing to a shape maker and then meeting Dylan and then the other people in the industry. And I met similar at the same time, I actually should also mention Mike Hernandez is Mike Hernandez. I mentioned him earlier, but he had a huge effect on shape and design. So uh, let's see here, I'm gonna just show, for those of you who aren't familiar, here's some of my oil paintings. I just think it's interesting to see the transition. So here's uh, some of my oil paintings. This is from my studio, you know, just, uh, probably uh, two miles from my, my studio. It's down in Laguna Beach. This is once again near my studio on the coast of California. It's up in the mountains in Colorado at Ralph Lorenz Ranch. He has a pretty nice property there. Oil paintings. This is now showing my gouache painting and how the gouache painting had changed me, which is a whole nother discussion. But wearing really, you can see how it's, the shapes are really abstracted in, mm -hmm. the, in the gouache painting and even though it's representational it still shows to be a ship it's still uh it's still abstracted marketplace in southern uh south america this is really abstracted this is a fish market in south america you can see the top birds on the left mm -hmm. just um lines and lines of fish just looking for shape and color and design another gouache up in the uh, mountains of whistler uh, uh an acrylic um painting uh done up the coast and now this is the transition for where you can see is um moving from that genre into this working in digital painting so this is what would be considered concept art if people aren't familiar and is and trying to get ideas and concepts through but using a medium and these are all painted digitally hmm. wow very impressive It's, and is that stuff coming out of your head? Yeah. So it's coming out of my head, but it's all based on, you know, knowledge from working in the, you know, working in it's, it's still all shapes. So when, when I stopped thinking of just oil painting landscapes, I just said, I'm just going to create shapes. I think the world opened up and that's why I think it's important to show that, that transition. And I mentioned, uh, Dylan, but I, you know, there's so many people I need to mention Brian. I've said a few times, but Brian, if I didn't know Brian, none of this would have happened. Brian is, he is not only an artist, the guy is a scientist. You go into yep. a studio, it's totally crazy. Yeah, he's he brilliant has, guy. You know, bugs, and then he has <laughs> these science fiction paintings, and then he has traditional paintings, and then he has uh, like a, like jars full of it, like it's a scientist, like you're coming to a scientist's um, laboratory. He's just mm -hmm. such an interesting person. And David Dibble too, there's just so many people that I should comment whenever I mention anyone. So, okay. I've done that, uh, show, shared that. I would, I, if I have minutes, I'll do a color study. If not, uh, no problem. Well, you have, uh, you, I, I can give you like four, four or five minutes. Oh, actually, that'd be good because then we can show that it only takes four or five minutes. Okay, good. So, let's, uh, people are loving this. Lots of positive comments. Hello from the Netherlands. Hello. Larry Hello. Moore is watching. Hello, Larry. See you tomorrow. Larry Moore's in there. Larry, I was talking about you. I don't know if you heard that. So, uh, I didn't say anything nice. He was saying bad things. <laughs> he probably was. <laughs> no, yeah. I was saying you were. <laughs> yeah, I'll talk to Larry and I in our discussions of a uh, limited palette of just yellow. Right, Larry? Yeah. Okay, uh, let's do, uh, let's do, which one should we do a color study of? Uh, maybe the mountainscape. So let's take this one. We'll bring it closer. So uh, you know, this is also something I think is important for everybody is, is painting from a reference, from a photo, from a, um, from life. Now I'll zoom in on this, Eric, since you had asked me to zoom in. Um, actually, I'm going to grab a different one, I think. Oh, let's do this one. Uh, I'm using my four minutes. So I'm just moving it. That's unfortunate. But uh, the... 
that we, whenever you're painting and you're looking at a scene, you have to remember there is a moment of memory that you're memorizing what you're looking at and then you're painting. So if you're not facing your painting, you're probably not gonna do as well because it takes memory skills. So even right here, as I'm gonna work on color, I don't wanna be remembering that color as I work across my, my canvas. I wanna put it right next to it because it's only gonna help me. My memorization time is so much smaller. Um, can you, you can see my palette on the right here, right? Can you see? Yeah, yes, palette? yes. Yeah, so I believe color lives in the middle. So I don't want to paint here. There's no temperature. I don't want to paint here. There's no temperature. I want to paint somewhere in between there. And that's the same with on my palette. I don't paint with white. I don't paint with straight black. You know, it always has a, a temperature variation. I'm going to run out of time. I know it. I'm going to go long. That's okay. And we might get cut off on a couple of platforms, but I'm going to extend. Okay. Well, the, I'm going to just show how quick you can just put in a color study. Yeah. This isn't hours. Uh, this is moments. And trying to do, it's all about relationships, right? Just like life. It's all about relationships. And uh, let's see here. And the only way I ever know if I have the right color is by putting it down. Like I, that's one of the other things I always say. Like, I don't know on my palette. I'm guessing on my palette. I know if I have the right color once I get it off my palette. So I think often people will say, well, I'm such a slow painter. I think it's because there's just too much time being spent on decisions. Make the decision. I, once again, I may not be right, but I am certain. Make the decision. If it's wrong, move on. Now also see how I'm carving, right? I didn't, I never care if I'm right on the money on these shapes. And just to let you know, in Photoshop and other digital platforms, there is something called layers. I don't have to do this all on the same layer, which right. is an advantage, but I'm not painting that way here because I don't have layers if I'm working on a canvas. So I want to just make sure people understood that there's not, oh, that's a trick in Photoshop. No, there's, there's no tricks happening here. It's straight paint to canvas and just worrying about how those forms and shapes can, can be uh, manipulated. You know, the best paintings come from those times when you don't have time for decisions. Yeah. Isn't that true? Have you ever read the uh, book by Malcolm Gladwell, a uh, blink? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And discussion of, Hey, your first quick decision might be best. So, okay. Uh, this is not carved real well, so it takes some, some time to carve it back out. Um, but I'll take just, if you can give me, how about a minute and a half? I'll we'll take what you need. We're, okay. we're cool. Great. For those of you who had to tune in for a lunch hour and had to leave, thank you for tuning in. Uh, remind you guys that we'll be here every day and uh, also remind you to make sure you get signed up before uh, Thanksgiving for Watercolor Live so you can save some money on that. Now I've done my job. All right. <laughs> nice. Yeah, and I mentioned in the beginning, but I do appreciate your thank you for, for doing this for everyone during this. This is it's a bright spot and much appreciated. Thank you. Um, I do want to make a comment while I do this is when I'm dropping in that cloud, a, you know, I could, I, this could also be a lesson on what not to do, but I wanted to show you when I talk about temperature, if you look at that cloud, it lives within my world. Now watch, because we look at clouds and think they're white. Watch what happens when I put white in my clouds. Yeah. All of a sudden it doesn't live in my world anymore because the clouds are not right next to you. You're looking through atmosphere, which means you're looking through something to get there. They can't be straight white. Oh, wow. It's interesting. Uh, just, I, I love everything to do with design art, everything, but something called simultaneous contrast. 
watch this. I'm going to color pick because you can do it here. I'm going to grab that color and I just put it down here as you probably saw. I thought the rocks were way too bright, which they are. So I thought I would grab the cloud because it was so much darker. But in reality, it was the exact same value. It was just a contrast between the darker value on the ground and the contrast yeah. of the color variation. Yeah. So those are interesting things to play with. All uh, right. Okay. Let me put just one more layer on. I'm not using any fancy brushwork once again, which in Photoshop I could, or if you're working in oil, you could. This is a round brush, so it's not it's not going to give me any benefit of the doubt on shapes, right? All I can do is carve. It's my one option. Okay, let's get a little bit of snow and then we'll we'll call this. Actually, we need a little bit of let's see that temperature. There's so many things I can't talk about. There's just too much to talk about that uh, as I'm painting this on choices of why why I'm I'm moving. But right here, you want I want to keep the um, there you go. The the green that I'm see, perceiving in the distance is looking through that same atmosphere as the uh, clouds are. So I can't miss that opportunity um, to show it through atmosphere. What I'm saying is, and give you a contrast, it's made of the same material as this tree. And this is another accident a lot of people make, I made in the past. So now I'm gonna paint that whole hill like that because I perceive, well, it's green trees and those are green trees, yeah. but I'm looking through something called atmosphere and that's gonna give me distance. Okay, I think though, of course, I'll, once we hang up, I'll finish this because I can't leave something that's undone. But uh, I think this at least gets some of my ideas across. Go ahead and finish it. All right. You okay with that? I do have some. I'm meetings. okay. I know you have time, things that you got to do. So I Great. will. Uh, I I have a, a meeting coming up in a few minutes too. But go ahead if you want us a little more time. I'm I'm okay. cool with it. You guys are. Everyone's okay with that, and I do have. That's the difference with my job now, though. I have so many meetings. <laughs> I, I right before this, I popped out of a meeting just to hop in here. So. But I think I can spend a few more minutes. All right. Thank you for that. I think this okay. is so compelling. Thank you. So you've got that, you know, and if you look in the photograph of, of the distant green on the side of that hill, it does have a sense of a, a, a little bit of yellow in it. Is that the photograph making that up? Or is that, I mean, if you saw that in life, would that be that yellow or would it be more like what Are you talking that? about this? Yeah. Yes, it does. But you know what? Uh, here's a super interesting thing, I think. So, uh, yes, there is yellow. Um, and these are all things I can't talk about because I'm just working too fast. So yellow is the weakest wavelength in, in the physics of light. Right. So that's why things are being reduced, which is so interesting. As things go to the cool side, they're going to lean bluer because green is made of yellow and blue. So it's going to pull out and other factors, right, that the particles in the air. And, but also on the green side, it tends to go warmer, which is, here's a, you know, I always hate giving um, um, pigment tips because quite often, it, for me, it's all relationships. It's not like how you mix skin color. Well, it depends always what you're looking at. Is it the hand, just the face, is it what type of person? But here's a, just a little trick. When I'm painting an area like this, since you ask an area like this in the distance, I quite often create that color with a blue, like an ultra green blue or something like that, and a cad red light. Now, why do I work a cad red light and not an alizarin or something like that on the light side? Because a cad red light actually has yellow in it, but it's so distorted by the red or so influenced by the red that it now will give me a hint of green in my, in my distant mountains but it will never go as far as a yellow and blue going green or a red and blue that's which will go purple. Yeah. And if that gets kind of heavy for those people working in pigment, but it, the reason I share it is because it's a mindset. Uh, yeah. When you mentioned about that yellow, that's how I would, I would get to those yellows with a cad red rather, and then maybe a, a, a cooler red in other areas, the cad red would be enough to push me in there. Now in this one, I probably would have had a, a hair of yellow in how I painted that color. But I know that's kind of heavy thinking, deep water, but 
Um, yes, there is yellow, but it's how you get there. And, and I'm gonna color pick so you can see, look how gray that color was on my palette. That's the advantage here, because you can see my thinking. That, that was a really great color. It only looks the correct color because of relationship. And that's right. so important in painting, yeah. is my relationships are right. Uh, and speaking of relationships, I'm noticing that my water is looking like grass. Now, if, if I, it didn't look like grass until I put that blue stripe in the background. But as soon as I put that blue stripe with the same look tint here, I'm actually, I'll take it out and show you. It started to look like grass because that started to look like water. So it's, it's really interesting on, on how we need to use uh, color and, and what they're going to evoke in our senses. Yeah. Yeah, so, relationships are everything, aren't they? Yeah. And so I can get those spot the green, which I certainly see, but I need to give a little bit of variation um, through that, you know, give it a little more water. That's a two. You can see that there's control Z coming in handy. I don't have that. It's just kind of testing. And there's a lot. control Z in life. Yes, totally. If I was, uh, and I will add, if I was working, I'd work the same way. I just put what I would tend to do. Let me show you how I would do it. I would just put a color down and then I would just put enough. I wouldn't have it cover something else, but I put a color dab there and say, no, that isn't quite the right color. Then I'd cover it with another color dab and then to cover it with another color dab until I got there. But what ends up happening is people will say, oh, I really like your painterly style. Well, that painterly style was a 150 mistakes that I'm going <laughs> up and give you all this patchworked paint, which, which then gets interesting. I'm going to take that same idea on this distant mountain and show how by just going in just a slightly warmer direction. There we go. That I can show how those mountain shapes can work. And right. they're leaning. I'm also seeing as soon as I do that, everything relates. That's those relationships that uh, I see my, oh, changed. Yeah. my clouds then get too warm. There we go. That just cools it. It's just a hair. I hope maybe you can see it on your screen. It's so slight yeah. how I have uh, cooled that, but it's still a cooling. Fantastic. So uh, I think though I want to go further, I think we should stop there. I think there's there's plenty of information. That was a lot uh, a lot of information there to to share. I mean, I don't mind sharing more, but I think it's a lot to take in as I'm talking that quick and then designing. But anyway, you can see there that as I design that now, I'll, I will make comments. This is the other thing I will say. You have to be critical. So when I look at my painting right now, my and I zoomed out because I zoomed in, I wouldn't normally paint that close, is my water is way too high of a value. That's why, I mean, way too dark of a value. Yeah. That's why it wasn't reading correctly. It started to read like grass, which is a darker value, is I need to pull, pull that whole value up to right. get closer to the sky range. Um, but that's the advantage of being farther away is catching those sort of shapes quickly. Right, step back. Yeah, step back and move away. Okay. So, All right, John, yeah. well, this, is, this has been absolutely fabulous. Um, really terrific today. Thank you so much for this. My pleasure. I've, uh, I've, I think I've learned more today than I've learned in a long time. It was uh, really worth doing. I think everybody did. Lots of positive comments. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. There we go. Okay. I apologize. I had a I had a glitch. No, don't worry. Um, John, thank you. Uh, this has been absolutely wonderful. Appreciate it. My pleasure. I just uh hey everyone, be well during COVID. Wishing the whole world the best and and keep painting, keep a positive outlook. Yeah. Uh John's video uh John is at burtonartstudio.com if you want to find him and better buy those paintings since he's not doing them anymore. Better buy them all up. Oh, yeah, I should. I'm in mean, Instagram as well. John Burton Art, if you'd like to look up. John Burton Art. Okay, I don't have that on here, but okay, great. Well, thank you, John. And um, everybody, make sure you uh, leave comments for John. Maybe he'll, after work tonight, he'll go back into the comments and answer some questions or something for you. My pleasure. All right. Thanks, John.
Well, our guest today was John Burton. We ran a little long, which we try not to do. My apologies if we had to cut you off. Uh, so thank you for watching today. Uh, my name is Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plein Air. A reminder that uh, Thanksgiving is coming up, the deadline. A uh, couple of things that week, actually. The Plein Air Salon Art Competition, $15,000 grand prize, $30,000 in other prizes. Uh, you've got to get your paintings in before the end of the month for this month's competition. Also, a reminder that the end of the month is the time to, to book Watercolor Live before the price goes up. $200. We have some of the world's leading artists on Watercolor Live. And let me just show you a couple of them. Uh, well, I'll just show them all to you real quickly. And you can hang if you want to. If not, um, we have, hang on a second, I got to get something else off the screen here. We have Daniel Marshall. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to comment on each one because they're all just world class artists. Thomas W. Schaller, Andy Evenson, Stephen Zhang. Suni Warren, Matt Bird, Pablo Rubin, who we had on the other day from Spain, Mario Robinson, Lauren McCracken, Joseph Sabukbich, Keiko Tanabe, John Salomon, Jean Peterson, Kim Machinko, Brenda Swenson, Michael Holter, Agus McEwen, who you saw yesterday, and uh, Linda Daly Baker. So uh, they're going to be on Watercolor Live. Just get that at watercolorlive.com. Thank you guys for tuning in today, and I uh, will see you tomorrow. We're here every day at 12 noon on Facebook and YouTube, and also today at 3 p.m. I think I completely forgot to mention that. Ooh, probably should do that. Uh, today at 3 p.m., we have a fabulous video for you. And it's going to be, actually, I don't have the graphic. I don't know where it is. But um, the video today is not listed here. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I apologize for that. I should be better prepared. Thank you for watching. I'm Eric Rhodes. Bye-bye.